Overlay for us was an incredibly literal operation. Overlay is the stacking of one thing on top of another. So we have an object, we put it on the ground, we stack another object on top of that object. I think what's exciting to us about that idea of overlay is that it starts to play some interesting games with some of the conventions of architecture. So if you are just stacking and setting one thing on top of another, then you have to start asking, like, where is the space where program and people go? Um, because we're not designing con empty containers of things. Instead, we're aggregating piles of things. I think it also goes without saying that once you start stacking things, you have to start dealing with issues of adjacency and all things actually make contact, which obviously in the work has been uh, a recurring theme. So just reconciling those kind of issues has been really important and something that came out of this process. I guess there's two stories to be told about the installation. Um, the first one is just the story of how it was made. So what we're looking at are plywood ribs that have been covered in expensive quilting fabric that's then shot with insulation foam to expand the mats between the plywood ribs and on top of that there's a layer of lath like you get in a kind of lath and plaster construction technique from years ago uh, and then on top of the lath there's a lightweight concrete um, that's hand finished with a small trowel and around the entire perimeter, uh, there's a continuous MDF base that's been uh, kind of custom designed. The second story to tell about the lumps is sort of what they are and how they operate. Um, so again, like our approach to the theme overlay, it, it can't be literal enough. And in fact, the, the literalness of the installation starts to open up some new intellectual territory for us. So, the title, if I can remember it off the cuff here, is um, just a survey of what's here from the ground up. So that starts with two pillows, two lumps, three tables, three books, nine tchotchkes. Um, and we're describing it as a kind of living room turned inside out, where the occasional tables are out resting on the landscape instead of tucked inside. Um, and what's really interesting to us is how that kind of liberates the edge of what we're doing and it implicates the entire room rather than being a kind of hermetically sealed thing in a white gallery. There's, there's definitely a shuffle and an appropriation of different elements. So yet, yeah, as you mentioned, your, your sofa is now plastered on the inside of your landscape. Um, how do you reconcile that? Words and language, but particularly humor, um, are for us like that image in the opening sequence of The Simpsons where he's manipulating a radioactive isotope with gloves. So for us, the radioactive isotope is a certain intellectual history and like the canon of architecture. Humor and a certain kind of language um, give us the protective and prophylactic gear that we need to manipulate that safely and with power while still staying firmly on the kind of architecture and practitioner side of the fence. It's interesting that you brought that up in handling the radioactive isotope with gloves, because ultimately that isotope then also ends up in the backseat of the car somewhere. And we talk about that in humor often, that it's, there's kind of a delicate line to toe between really understanding the discipline and your contemporaries and the, the lineage, that, all of it, and then also acknowledging when it falls apart spectacularly and, and um, finding a, a way to deal with that. So we have no desire to be uh, theorists or critics, um, and we find that a certain very kind of strategic approach to language and a certain way of engaging with humor lets us make what we think are kind of powerful manipulations to theory and criticism without actually becoming theorists or critics. So you almost need a diagram to tackle it, and humor is our diagram, or that, that certain kind of deadpan language is our diagram for wrestling. A lot of the language that we use to describe our work comes from two sources. One is that we're just lifting language from the picturesque. So lumps, <coughs> clumps, belts, um, all of that just comes from Humphrey Repton and Uvedale Price. They had a really interesting way of talking about landscape and objects in the landscape. A second source of our language is that we're 
surveying the world around us and trying to find objects that occupy a kind of tricky or interesting state where they are both objects and sites. So we'll cue in on things like hills because you see it as an object in the landscape but you can walk on it or build on it like a site. And we would say things like blankets and pillows and pockets are similarly interesting and problematic objects and so we're just constantly adding those terms to a kind of bucket that we use again and again. And I think there's a, a deliberate kind of avoidance of describing features too directly so when we talk about something I often we, we've had particular arguments about this where I, my contention is always that we have to look with our eyes. I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that we'll describe a behavior when we see something in our work and try to attribute something out there in the world that represents that. So we, I think, use it as kind of a tool for critiquing our own work or better trying to understand it. We're constantly mm -hmm. challenging one another to just look at a thing and tell each other what is actually there, um, not the presumed history of what's there. For a long time, we've maintained two parallel practices um, that are slowly collapsing into practice. And it's, it's not a Ben practice and an Andrew practice, it's that we um, have taken certain academic opportunities to just engage in pure speculation with maybe no immediate architectural end in sight. And then parallel to that, since 2005, since the moment we graduated, we have been committed to an agenda of built work where we sustain ourselves financially from the proceeds of our practice. So it's been continuously in operation, building for real sort of walk-in everyday clients. Um, and slowly those two agendas are getting closer and closer together. Um, they don't match yet, but I would say maybe in another five years they will start to match. And I think <clears throat> to the extent that it's no longer applicable, I would say that in the past, in the past few years, really there were moments, and I think we refer to it often as uh, moments of invention in relatively conventional work. Um, now those moments are starting to actually reinform the design process and um, it, they become a little more complex in a positive way. We've been very skeptical of representation, so a model that is a representation of a building has made us nervous in the past, so we've really tried to design these things that just are what they are. They don't represent anything. Um, but I think in order for the speculative work to behave like buildings and look like buildings, um, we've got to find a way to get comfortable with the representative quality of a model and the idea of imagining a person in this small scale representation. So that sounds like a pretty simple thing. In fact, I think it's a rudimentary thing um, that one maybe should have learned in their first year of graduate school. And we're just now becoming comfortable. This is kind of a call to arms, and I won't name names specifically, but we've been called to task that there seems to be some interest in the work, and is it scalable, and what happens um, as it, frankly, just gets bigger, which we're interested in, we would like to do, obviously we want to grow the practice, um, but it, I, I don't think it's rudimentary at all that's going to be monumental. We're going to be forced to confront all kinds of uncomfortable questions, and it will be very interesting to see how what happens next. Yeah, so I think in a way what we're seeing with the lead prize installation is that this ends a certain line of inquiry for us um, and kind of draws a line after which um, 